correlational research um, looks at relationships between two or more variables, uh, whereas experimental uh, manipulates a variable. Um, so this only describes a relationship and not cause and effect. Usually in correlational research, there will be a scatter plot used, and that's to determine a positive or negative correlation. So another difference between experimental and correlational is participants are not randomly assigned to treatment conditions. Uh, and that's because in correlational research, you're usually looking for a relationship between two variables. So you want uh, certain characteristics in those variables. Um, correlational research is really useful in healthcare because it can de help determine things like why clients may or not be using your service. Um, and this can really help uh, researchers uh, obtain the information necessary to create new policies or procedures. And also it can help develop new research in the future. Okay, so some more characteristics of correlational research is uh, there's usually a large sample size and that is to allow for greater generalizability. Pearson's R is usually used to uh, uh, measure the correlations uh, in the research. And like I said before, the uh, scatter plots are often used to find a direction or a trend for the uh, correlational research data. There are a few advantages to using correlational research, and those include uh, it's inexpensive, um, easier, and quicker uh, compared to other types of research. In 2003, Italian researchers published a scientific article claiming that eating pizza can reduce the risk of certain cancers. That's right. One of the most consumed foods on Super Bowl Sunday, greasy, cheesy, salty pizza, is linked to fighting cancer. Newspaper headlines, online blogs, and editorials picked up on this astonishing study, creating headlines like, Eating pizza cuts cancer risk, why pizza can fight cancer, and pizza reduces cancer risk. Now you may be thinking, can eating pizza really cut the risk of cancer? Is there a causal relationship between my favorite meat lover's deep dish and healthy living? Well... Not exactly. You see, correlation does not imply causation. That is to say, if A is related to B, that doesn't necessarily mean A caused B. This is a common error in our thinking. Looking deeper into the research findings, there is much more than meets the eye. In this psychedemia episode, I explore correlations, how two variables, yes, even peace and health, are related. It is very tempting, and even exciting for food lovers, to read these aforementioned headlines and think that eating pizza can cause a reduction in cancer risk. But other scientists, and even the authors of the study, caution readers to quickly make a causal relationship. It turns out that a Mediterranean diet is more likely the cause of fighting cancer and healthy living, a diet that is rich in olive oil, fish, grains, fruits, and yes, tomatoes, one of the main ingredients on a pizza. Why does a correlation not imply causation? It is common to think that when two things relate to one another or appear linked, like money and happiness, violent video games and aggressive behavior, and eating breakfast and success in school, that one caused the other. But there are several reasons to be cautious. For instance, maybe there is a third variable. Oftentimes, two variables appear to be linked to each other, but in actuality, there is another unknown or third variable that is a real source of the link. This is called the third variable problem. Let's take a look at one of these examples. For decades, psychologists have investigated a link between first-person killing games, like Grand Theft Auto and Call of Duty, and aggressiveness in boys. One could argue that playing violent video games causes aggressive behavior. 
This argument supports why politicians in the past have tried to put an age limit on purchasing violent video games. However, one could also make the argument that a child who is already aggressive is more likely to seek out and play violent video games because it connects to their personality. Of course, what about a third variable? Some studies have shown that exposure to family violence, like spousal and child abuse, is associated with youth violence and an increased risk for playing violent video games. This finding reminds us that we should not jump to conclusions when establishing links between two variables. It is also very common for people to see relationships between variables when none exist, like eating candy and hyperactivity. This is called an illusory correlation. Let's take a look at a common example ubiquitous in sports. Superstitions. Athletes are renowned for being superstitious. They often develop unusual rituals to keep hitting streaks alive or to end terrible slubs, for example. Anything to get the bad juju off their back, whether wearing the same lucky socks or eating the same meal before every game. From a psychological perspective, athletes have convinced themselves that a relationship exists between performing specific rituals and performing well on a field. Unfortunately, this relationship is merely a fallacy. So, why do psychologists conduct correlational research? Foremost, psychologists are interested in the relationship between two variables, specifically how well one variable predicts the presence or absence of another variable. Psychologists study relationships in all walks of life, like the relationship between attendance and GPA, money and happiness, intelligence and income, and depression and eating habits. Notice how the arrows are pointing in both directions. As I stated previously, this is because it's very difficult to make a causal relationship between two variables. Figuring out how closely two variables relate to or predict one another is measured using a statistical measure called correlation coefficient. This index measures the strength of a correlation. Represented by Pearson's R, the value of a correlation can range from positive 1.0 to negative 1.0, each being a perfect correlation. An R of zero means no relationship exists between two variables. A correlation of positive 0.87, for example, will be considered very strong, while a negative 0.27 will be considered weak. Before we move on, check your understanding of the strength of a correlation. Take a look at the following R values and identify the strength of each score. Pause the video here. How'd you do? Think about the mistakes you made, if any, and rewind the video to clarify any confusion. It is important to note that positive doesn't mean good and negative doesn't mean bad, but rather positive and negative signify the direction of the correlation. Specifically, a positive correlation implies that one variable predicts the presence of another variable. In other words, as the value of one variable increases, the value of the other variable increases as well. For example, there is a positive correlation between the time you spend on a treadmill and the number of calories burned. In other words, the more you run, the more calories you lose. There is also a positive correlation between the amount of coffee you drink and level of alertness. The more coffee you drink, the more alert you will be in the classroom or office. Conversely, a negative correlation implies that one variable predicts the absence of another variable. In other words, as the value of one variable increases, the value of the other variable decreases. For example, there is a negative correlation between alcohol consumption and judgment. In other words, the more alcohol you drink, the less judgment one has. There is also a negative correlation between the amount of garlic in your home and vampires. The more garlic hanging in your kitchen, the less vampires will step foot in your house. Check your understanding of positive and negative correlations. Pause the video here and brainstorm a few examples before moving on. Lastly, how do psychologists graph correlations? Correlations are graphed on scatter plots, like the one seen above. The slope of the scatter plot indicates the direction of the correlation, while the scatter of the data points indicates the strength. Each participant or event in a study is represented by a dot or data point on the scatter plot. The more scatter between data points, for example, would mean there is a weak correlation between two variables. The closer the data points are bunched together on the line of best fit would indicate a stronger relationship. Before we finish, check your understanding of the correlational method. Fill in the blanks to make the statement accurate. Pause the video here before checking your answers. Sample size and selection are very important for correlational research. As we said earlier, sample sizes for correlational research should be larger. This allows the researcher to have statistically significant data and make the study results more generalizable. 
There are many methods used for data collection. A few of the popular methods used include naturalistic observation, surveys, and archival research. Naturalistic observation is when data is collected by observing subjects in their natural environment without any interaction with the subjects. Surveys are done by obtaining research from a random selection of subjects. This can be done through the use of mail surveys, email and internet surveys, as well as in-person interviews. Archival research happens when data from other research is analyzed for possible correlations. There are many ways to collect data for a correlational study. It needs to be efficient enough to include a large sample size, but not compromise the consistency of the results. The instruments used to gather data need to be reliable in order to give generalizable results. For example, do you have enough people that are properly trained to give consistent interviews if that's your method of data collection, or is your survey consistent enough and it is in the same format given to every person? Overall, you want to make sure that when deciding how to gather data, the, mater, the method of collection will produce the most accurate results. Okay, so you may be asking yourself if correlational research uh, is appropriate to use an evidence-based practice, which is uh, what we use in, like, in the medical field. So you can use correlational research in evidence-based practice. Uh, you can use it to supplement other evidence. Uh, so basically, uh, if you find a correlation with something, you can take that information and bolster other research. Um, also, you can find through correlational research just um, interesting findings uh, that can lead you to perform other research. So that's probably the biggest um, use for correlational research and evidence-based practice is just to lead you to a uh, um, topic to research on. Um, also, every study needs um, a foundation and a reason for it to be performed. Correlational research can help provide that. Um, so that basically just means it can provide like the justification for further studies. Whether internal validity or external validity is more important has been a controversial topic in the research community. Campbell and Stanley stated that although ideally speaking, a good study should be strong in both types of validity, internal validity is indispensable and essential while the question of external validity is never completely answerable. So for this example of correlational research, um, the effects of self-efficacy on social entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship and education was um, examined. So there were 220 pre-service teachers, uh, and they were randomly selected. Um, and 
a general self-efficacy scale was used to determine self-efficacy levels and the social entrepreneurship characteristics of pre-service teacher scale was used to assess entrepreneurial characteristics. And a correlational analysis was used to determine the relationship between self-efficacy and social entrepreneurship among these pre-service teachers. This is, a, uh, this is the chart used in the research to examine the results. Um, Pearson's R was used to measure the correlation. So the researchers ultimately found that there is a relationship between self-efficacy and entrepreneurship. Um, they found that effort and persistence predicted creativity and risk-taking. And those are features of entrepreneurship. So they can take these findings and they can help develop better teachers um, by uh, combining activities related to self-efficacy and entrepreneurship. This is just uh, one example of how you can use correlational research. Um, an example in the field of dietetics would be possibly exploring um, dietitian leadership and patient outcomes. So this could lead to procedural changes and recommendations for practicing if you found a correlation between leadership and patient outcomes. So you might want to focus more on developing uh, leadership and dietitians to help improve patient outcomes if you define a correlation.